Khalistan in America. We came here so we could organize a stronger political movement, and a more sophisticated militancy. Everywhere in India Sikhs are being killed. So instead of just getting wiped out, we want to gather here so we can prepare ourselves for future struggle. We want to convey our message to the democratic people here. Man to man, we want to say that we need our own country. We are not related socially, morally, or religiously to Hindu people. We are different. We had a country before the British came, but through various devious means we ended up losing it. We have a good culture, a strong culture, and we are good people. We need help to establish a Sikh nation. Man to man we want to say, help us. Yes, I was in Perth and I don't remember the name of the pub, but anyway one guy came up to me and grabbed me by my coat. He said, are you a follower of Ayatollah Khomeini? What the hell are you doing over here? At that time the Ayatollah Khomeini thing was really hot. I was just dazed. I said, whoa, man, what are you saying? Then I had to explain the whole thing, that this is not the same turban that Khomeini tied, nor the same beard, that I was from a totally different religion. So little do people know about our faith. I was in my cab and I picked up a fare one evening, two drunken businessmen. They started laughing and falling over each other, and one said, take us to the World Trade Center. They thought this was really funny. I stopped the cab, and hauled them out by their collars. I stood them there on the sidewalk and gave them an education about Sikhism. They were really shocked. Finally I told them to never taunt a Sikh that way again, and I drove off. We are ordinary people. We are not terrorists. But if you see the list from the Indian Embassy, we will be listed as terrorists, because we are fighting for our rights. If you say that right is right, and wrong is wrong, you are a terrorist. Here you have free speech. But if we stand in front of the Indian Embassy and raise our voices, we are put on record as being terrorists. It's quite embarrassing. But anyway, at least we are not killed here. We have shelter in this country and we can work for our living in this country. We are respected in this country. How thankful we are. To tell you the truth, I would die if somebody gave me a gun and told me to shoot a person. I am just not capable of it. But you see, when you have to run a country, you can't run a country just by guns. It wouldn't last very long if you tried. Khalistan will need people from a wide spectrum, with different capabilities. There will be room for everybody. Even room for you. Anthropologists have been making a virtue of necessity, ever since Malinowski, who managed to write one of the classic ethnographies in the canon, while interned in the Trobriand Islands during World War I. I started out studying North American Sikhs because, quite simply, things had become difficult for me in India. My Muslim last name, sadly, became an issue on my last visit to Bihar, and I knew that with Sikhs, unlike with Hindus, this facet of my identity would help rather than hurt. I will surely be accused of working for Pakistan by some more devious or paranoid Indian critics, which is to my mind, an idea beneath comment. Investigating militancy in Punjab itself, besides being dangerous, is difficult because people are simply not free to express themselves, in the way they can overseas, and are far more suspicious about inquisitive outsiders. Joyce Pettigrew, who did do fieldwork in Punjab, nevertheless had to ask a Sikh in London to acquire taped interviews, on her behalf for her book. So what with one thing and another, I ended up pursuing expatriates, and though I originally considered it a second best option, I ended up valuing it as an especially fruitful window into Khalistani nationalism. Sikhs overseas have always been heavily involved in affairs in the homeland, playing a particularly critical political role in the Gadar Rebellion, and in the current separatist insurgency. Today, they are helped in their continuing involvement by technology, Khalistani leaders never go anywhere without being connected by multiple fax and phone lines to each other, not to speak of the Khalsa Net Computer Network, that links Sikhs around the world. Such connection, 
unlike the telegraph and mail system of gadder times, is instantaneous. Sikhs in California often hear the latest news before Sikhs in Delhi do. I used the word Khalistani at various points in this book, but I sometimes asked myself whether Khalistani was an adjective that made sense in the absence of an actual country called Khalistan. Once I voiced this concern to a group of Sikhs with whom I was talking. My interlocutors were way ahead of me. Of course we are Khalistani, they said. We are all part of the Khalistan nation wherever we are. In effect, they were saying that Khalistan is a state of mind. In this they were following the spirit of Benedict Anderson, whose concept of the imagined community, helped launch the new denaturalized understanding of collectivity, just discussed. He linked his conception to territory, in a way that Khalistani Sikhs cannot however, at least not yet. Wherever Khalistani Sikhs are, Khalistan is. Recent works of scholarship have emphasized, the delinking of ethnicity and territory in the postmodern world, celebrating transnationalisms, that cut across cartographic and political boundaries. This is reshaping traditional understandings of immigration, emigration, country of origin, host country, and so on, as trans migrants are reconceived not as people who leave one nation behind to adopt a new national identity, but as people whose nationhood and identity crisscross classically imagined frontiers. So Portuguese are Portuguese everywhere, not only in the southwestern tip of Europe, Chinese are Chinese wherever they may be. While it would seem that such a deterritorialization of identity presents a challenge to the paradigm of the nation state, which links people to territory in a definitive way, in fact the picture is more complicated. Zionism is only the most notable example of a diasporan collectivity that inscribed its identity onto a piece of territory, making the maintenance of that territory as a permanent homeland critical to diasporan identity, despite the failure of most diasporan Jews to actually return to it. Akhil Gupta highlights this reinscription of identities onto geographical spaces as a critical feature of ethnicity in the current era and this makes sense of the seemingly paradoxical trends of deterritorialization on the one hand, and increasing nationalism on the other. If we apply this idea to the area under study here, it seems clear that the power of the Khalistan idea is enhanced, not diminished, by the dispersion of Sikhs outside of Punjab and India. And this is expressed in monetary, political, and moral support for Khalistan from diasporan Sikhs, despite the fact that many or most would not move to Khalistan, if it were indeed created. The idea that Khalistan is where Sikhs are, is really a way of inscribing nationhood, onto what was classically conceived as the Panth, implied also by Bindran Walla's use of Kham, to talk about Panth in the days before Khalistan became the rallying cry of the discontented. Despite the linkage of the territory of Punjab, with Khalistani nationalism in contemporary militant rhetoric, and despite the fact that historically there is no doubt that Punjab was the center and heartbeat of the Panth, the world of Sikhism was traditionally in no way constrained by the geography of the land of five rivers. In Guru Nanak's legendary travels, he in effect circumambulated the world, metaphorically incorporating the entire universe within the realm of Sikhism. Two of the five tax or thrones of Sikhism, are outside of Punjab, one in Bihar and one in Maharashtra, reflecting the fact that the lives of the ten gurus, were in no way restricted to the northwestern corner of the subcontinent. The Adi Granth is explicitly ecumenical. And all of this has led to the perfectly appropriate appeal of the Sikh faith to people outside Punjab, for example, in the small but steadfast community of American converts to Sikhism. But the universalist message of Sikhism is, in the Khalistan movement, tied up with a specifically Punjabi nationalism, in a way troubling for example, to Iqbal Singh of Chapter 3, who expressed his unease by asserting that Khalistan is a need, not a destiny, and that Sikhs simply needed some place where they could live as true Sikhs, whether that be London or Amritsar. Harpal Singh of Chapter 5, however, feels the opposite, exalting Punjabi yet, as a critical component of the Khalistan idea. In the tension between these two viewpoints, 
lies a problematic ambiguity in the notion of self-determination for a Sikh homeland of Khalistan. Are we talking about some kind of theocratic state here, in which Sikh, equals Punjabi, equals Khalistani? Will this new state bring religion into the public realm, in which case, we will be concerned about the fate of minorities, democratic freedoms, secularism, and so on, points typically raised by those fearing exactly this future. Or are we talking about what is really a mere practical expedient, whereby a community whose rights have been trampled, seeks to set up an alternative framework, within which those rights could be guaranteed? In Pakistan, the question of whether the founders intended an Islamic state, that is, following a particular theopolitical line, or a Muslim state, that is, a place where Muslims could live freely, remains unresolved, as its parallel does in Israel. The gradual linkage of the idea of the Sikh community, to the idea of a Sikh nation inscribed on the territory of Punjab, developed primarily since independence, even though it now claims much earlier roots. The kingdom of Maharaja Ranjit Singh is, as we have seen, frequently drawn on in the discussion of Khalistan, because it was the only time when something like a Sikh state was in existence. The theme of communal harmony and tolerance under the enlightened rule of Ranjit Singh, is as celebrated by Khalistanis, as other aspects of Ranjit Singh's rule are suppressed. Without denying the historical evidence of a definable Sikh community, the point is that the notion of Sikh nationhood, linked to Punjabi territory, is not a traditional one. The claim to Khalistan as a nation-state, and reliance on the principle of self-determination to achieve it, are part of the discourse of modernity. The rise of the state as a political form in ancient times, was accompanied by the rise of warfare as we know it, and the rise of the modern nation-state in the West since 1648, the Treaty of Westphalia, likewise, gave rise to the particular understanding of warfare expressed by Clausewitz on war. The same Sikhs who defend the idea of self-determination in the form of one people, equals one nation, equals one state, and who try to imagine Khalistan, Kham, Pant, in these terms, also understand the legitimation of organized violence, or war, provided by statehood, in the modern Clausewitzian framework. In commenting that they are George Washingtons, or Menachembekans of sorts, Sikh militants rely on the idea that the establishment of a future state, will legitimate what they are doing now, turn acts of terrorism into acts of war. This has always been a problematic part of the Clausewitzian legacy, what to make of guerrilla non-state warfare. It pushes guerrillas in the direction of separatism, aimed at the formation of independent states, rather than toward regional autonomies, national reforms, or other compromise solutions, for it is primarily in the achievement of independence, that the violence of the guerrillas will be vindicated. Sukha and Jinda, who delivered justice to General Vaidya, consciously placed the activities of Khalistanis, squarely amongst those of other revolutionaries in their farewell missive. Quote. When nations wake up, even history begins to shiver. During such, moments, Abanda Bahadur bids farewell to his peace dwelling, and destroys a state of suppression like Sir Hind, a Che Guevara turns down a ministership of Cuba, loads a gun on his breast, and entrenches against the enemies in the forests of Bolivia, a Nelson Mandela rejects the ideology of apartheid, and prefers to spend his life in a dark prison cell. Unquote. Fighting a war of independence plays well abroad today, since self-determination is one thing everybody understands, whatever they may know or not know about Sikhism or Punjab. Sikhs are not linked to Khomeini, Sikhs didn't blow up the World Trade Center. The rhetoric of peoplehood, nationhood, and statehood has come to dominate discussion among expatriate Sikhs, totally eclipsing talk of particulars, like grain prices or water distribution. The flurry of movements of self-determination across the globe, comprising what Bernard Nietzscheman calls, the Third World War, is a logical outcome of the ideal of the nation-state, now extended to previously unrepresented or submerged groups. And the explosion of violent conflicts over it, is traceable to the Clausewitzian scheme, that legitimates political violence only by linking it to state authority. In a deterritorialized world, 
people are increasingly getting involved in self-determination movements and their violent concomitants, in regions far from the ones in which they reside. Certainly in the Khalistani Sikh case, the diasporan Sikh community has been not only part of, but at the forefront of the Khalistani insurgency. This fact has inspired a considerable body of scholarship. Arthur Helwig, cites the alienation of migrant Sikhs from host societies abroad, their limited opportunities there, and the organizational vigor of expatriate Gurdwaras, to explain why Khalistani activism, becomes a likely path to honor and achievement. Mark Jurgensmeyer, alternatively, emphasizes the migrants' marginalization, vis a vis the home Punjabi community, as the source of their desire to push forward a new framework, in which they would be not peripheral but central. Other studies focus on not the migrants' own situation, but the situation of the host countries in which they reside, exemplified most clearly by the Gadar movement, in which nationalist aspirations among expatriate Sikhs, were sparked by Canadian and American exclusionary policies, and critically tied to the failure of British Indian authorities to protect Indians abroad. This last perspective resonates well with many Sikhs outside of India today, who perceive the Indian embassy and consular apparatus, not only as unwilling or unable to protect them, but as in itself persecutorial. Vern Dusenberry's insights, into the politics of diasporan Sikh identity, are particularly interesting however, as they tie in usefully to the bigger picture before us, of a virtual fluorescence of self-determination movements worldwide, of which the Khalistan case is but one. Dusenberry relates the shift in Canada, from allegiance to the National Association of Canadians of Origins in India, to loyalty to local Gurdwaras, and the term Canadian Sikhs rather than East Indians. This shift, importantly, happened in Canada before the major developments in Punjab itself, that would make definition as a Sikh, rather than as an Indian, politically acceptable, before Operation Blue Star, before the post-assassination pogroms, before the declaration of Khalistan, and so on. Dusenberry traces it to Canada's multiculturalism policy put in place in 1971, noting that the local logic of multiculturalism in these pluralist polities, requires a distinctive source culture, derived from a recognized homeland or country of origin. The point is not that separatist movements overseas, are created by multiculturalism policies in Canada, that would be absurd. The roots of Sikh separatism are clearly in Punjab. But what Dusenberry's work does show, is how a North American socio-political trajectory, intersected with a different one in India, to produce the interesting situation in which the Canadian Sikh community, has become a key centre of the Khalistan movement. The resurgence of cultural identities and the rise of separatist nationalisms, West and East, are intertwined parts of the same global phenomenon. The demography of South Asian emigration patterns, plays a role in diaspora Sikh nationalism as well. In several countries, the proportion of Sikh immigrants relative to all Indian immigrants, is much higher than the proportion of Sikhs at home in India. In Britain, as many of half of all Indian immigrations may be of Sikh origin, and Sikhs have dominated the South Asian immigration scene in Canada, at several points in history, e.g., Gadar times in British Columbia. What this means is that in the ordinary perception of an overseas Sikh, the Sikh community is a major piece of the South Asian mosaic. When he or she sees the relatively lesser attention paid to Sikhs in India, where they are only 2% of the population, it appears as if the Sikh community's voice is being purposely ignored. This dynamic is exemplified by the controversy over all India radio broadcasts in the late 1970s. As an avowedly secular state, India compels its state-run radio to schedule proportionately equal amounts of religious programming, aimed at the various religious communities. But this formula, problematic even in India, was disastrous overseas, where Sikhs were never satisfied with the small amount of Sikh religious programming allotted. It was aimed at the 2% Indian minority, not the 50% diaspora contingent. Southall was full of turbans, but there was little curtain to be heard on Indian shortwave radio. A demand for a Sikh radio transmitter, to be set up at the Golden Temple complex, ensued 
but was rejected as a communal demand, not in keeping with the Indian policy of equal treatment of all faiths. Finally, Jagjit Singh Chauhan, the apostle of Khalistan based in London, went to Amritsar and illegally set one up. What was seen as inflammatory communalism in India, played as an appropriate redress of grievance in Britain. As noted in the previous discussion, there has been something of a backlash among erstwhile liberals, against the multiculturalist paradigm, and this has gone hand in hand, with a similar critique of the idea of self-determination. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, in Pandemonium, suggests that the principle of one people, one state, initiated in the very particular historical circumstances of World War I, and brought to a peak in the era of decolonization, has in the deterritorialized world of the late 20th century, resulted in total chaos. Any reader of newspapers today, would be hard-pressed to disagree with this, and a spate of books portraying movements of self-determination, as dangerously undermining the international order, are widely read and cited. These are typically conceived as tribalistic revivals of long-simmering ethnic hatreds, suddenly let loose due to political changes, economic upheavals, and so on. Though anthropology has relinquished this primordial image of ethnic conflict, in favor of a more complex understanding, of how changing group identities tie into dynamics of domination and resistance, on the popular level, the tribal, non-Western, uncivilized, retrogressive quality of such conflicts is increasingly emphasized. Letting loose a tirade of condemnation against such tribal-esque movements, which goes hand in hand with the unspoken claim, that we in civil society have outgrown them, can only provoke further expressions of just the sentiments of national identity and pride we scorn. Obviously, what we have to do, is work toward changing the conditions, that prompt the dismay, despair, and anger that turn into movements of revitalized nationhood, or religious mobilization. It is true that there are leaders in these sorts of movements, who seek to build a following in order to consolidate their own holds on power, a common theme in much of the current literature on ethnic conflict. But there are also large numbers of willing followers who, rather than being duped by manipulative demagogues, are seeking a way to assert themselves collectively, in forums in which they perceive their voices will not be heard as individuals. Although we might well consider what psychological and sociological factors, prompted the initial resurgence of Sikh orthodoxy amongst Bendranwala and his cohort, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, this part of the movement only ever attracted a minority of Sikhs. Focusing on fundamentalism, as expressed in the Bindranwala period, will miss the driving point of the movement for Khalistan today, which is that it is essentially a movement of political resistance. This is, to my mind, an inescapable fact for anybody who immerses herself in the Khalistani community. The celebration of religious orthodoxy is a symptom of discontent, and a vehicle for military mobilization, but not a cause in itself, not for the great majority of people involved in fighting for separate statehood. Sikhs are fighting against the desecration of their holy sites, and against the humiliation of their bodies. Indeed, this against feeling is a problem for some, like our friend Iqbal Singh, who asks just what it is that Khalistanis are fighting for but it is the element of resistance that in any case comes strongly to the fore, in my encounter with Khalistani Sikhs. The comparative study of religious fundamentalism, while a fruitful area of research across several disciplines, faces the key issue, of whether the various kinds of religious revivalisms now emerging around the world, are in fact comparable. Are we talking about apples and oranges, when we try to juxtapose Sikh with Christian, with Jewish with Islamic forms of religious revival? A problem with looking at disparate movements along a common axis of religious orthodoxy, is that by its nature, this enterprise wrenches them from their political contexts, turning what is better understood as a symptom of political distress, or a method of mobilization, into an object in itself. The study of terrorism parallels the study of fundamentalism nicely, privileging commonality of symptom and method, violence in this case, over great diversity in political context. Both the FMLN, and the Salvadoran government used to set off bombs, but if we focus on the bombing to the neglect of the politics, 
will not understand either. Beyond a glaring surface of mutilated bodies and burning buildings, lay an immense diversity of meanings. Likewise, Palestinian and Israeli expressions of fundamentalism, share surface features, but this common ground masks radically divergent political contexts. Nehru himself had made a similar distinction, when he noted that, honest communalism is fear, false communalism is political reaction. When we think of Khalistanis as religious zealots and as terrorists, and it is clear that most of the academic and popular literature portrays them that way, we wonder whether, in Dipankar Gupta's fortuitous phrase, our bleeding hearts should bleed with them. Violent fundamentalists, disrupting what most of the world thinks of as a democratic and tolerant state, would seem a source of pandemonium we wouldn't want to encourage. Yet it is clear that every act of state suppression targeting this community, has spurred, not dampened, its ardor. People want self-determination when the state in which they live, doesn't protect their rights, and despite the religious rhetoric of many of the militants, the majority of the people who support them, do so for precisely this pragmatic reason. If we want to prevent the chaos of unlimited conflicts surrounding self-determination, as I believe, with Moynihan, we must, the answer is to work clearly and unhesitatingly for the protection of human rights, and particularly minority rights, within existing states. If those rights can't be protected, then self-determination claims, however havoc-provoking, have a moral justification that is hard to deny. India since independence, has enjoyed an inexplicable immunity from international censure, as Barbara Crossett notes in her clear-eyed portrait, India, facing the 21st century. The images of Gandhian pacifism and Eastern mysticism, cover up a multitude of abuses, not only vis-a-vis -vis the outside, but within India as well where a huge media apparatus functions to keep people largely in the dark about the level of popular disaffection, and the erosions of democracy that are both on the increase. She notes that more Indians fall victim to their own army and police each year, than were killed during the entire 17-year dictatorship of Pinochet in Chile. Despite this appalling level of state violence, there have been no mass protests in India, and there is no significant international outcry. The mantra of democracy, as Crossett dubs it, overwhelms all dissenting voices. It would be too easy to say that if there had been no Operation Blue Star, no anti-Sikh massacres, no extrajudicial executions, no custodial rapes, that there would be no Khalistan movement. The example of Quebec, is right here to haunt us in that regard. But a great deal of the moral justification for insurgency, for many people both inside and outside the movement, wouldn't be there without this horrific crackdown. And it is clear that the repression of Sikhs, makes every aspect of Khalistani activism more vehement, and the potential for a kind of reactive fascism more dangerous. This is particularly the case when the panth, the calm, the nation, is spread across several continents, and has access to education, communications, and weapons on a global scale. But what can an anthropologist do in this situation? Where do our responsibilities lie when the people we study decide to fight a nationalist war?